we're going to be started on chapter seven. And in this chapter, we're going to study some important uh, uh, concepts uh, to start with in section 7.2. We're going to uh, look at what is called Euler's T function, one of the many important uh, functions in actually all of mathematics. Uh, so the objectives for this session are first we're going to start with the motivation for introducing this uh, function. Then we're going to actually define Euler's key function in the formal definition of it. Then we're going to give a formula that is not going to be using the definition. Uh, actually, was based on the definition, of course, to give the value of this function for a uh, part of the front, including time and then we're going to show there that Euler's speed function is a multiplicative function. And then this allows us to find a general formula for the value of this function for any part of the integer. And now we can, you know, get across some other uh, nice, uh, you know, proofs as well. All right, so let me get started with the uh, motivation. Yeah, we're going to go back to Euler's, uh, sorry, uh, Fermat's Fitted Theorem. Just to remind you of the statement. So we're going to recall Fermat. So that's what we are 
seeking to uh, see if we could generalize geometry in this sense. All right. The first thing that we're going to see that in order for this congruence to actually hold, the integer a must be relatively prime to m. All right. As actually given in Fermat's theorem. Well, we can have to actually this should be there. Okay, so this this is the first thing I'm gonna show. This is the following. The uh ones. Well, actually, a to the k, just to simplify matters, is not going to be congruent to 1 mod m, all right, for any k bigger than or equal, I think we want it to be bigger than or equal to 1 at least, right? Unless A is relatively prime. Uh, actually, let me put it in a different way because I'm, I don't find that it's going to hold. In fact, we're going to see it's going to hold, but let me write it so for any if. If the greatest common divisor A and M is not equal to one, means it's going to be bigger. All right, so we're going to prove this. So let's assume that uh, D is the greatest common divisor of A. M actually bigger than one, and we have A to the K is over one mod M for some K. So now we're also going to do it by contradiction for some K bigger than one. All right. Now let's see what that does this involve. So we have uh, a to the k congruent to one on m implies that m divides a to the k minus one, and this in itself implies that a k minus one is equal to m multiplied by l for some integer. Now, also now this will take the uh, D is equal to the greatest common divisor, AM. This implies that D divides A and D divides M. Also, A divides Sorry, D divides A implies D divides any power of A. This implies D divides A to the K. Now we're going to put these together in here. So we have D divides M, all right? And D divides A to the K. So it means that it divides any linear combination of these, all right? So we have. Uh, D divides this, and let me actually go from here, so we can see that A to the K equal ML uh, plus 1. So uh, this implies that D divides uh, A to the K, which is equal ML plus 1. All right, now we're going to take uh, both of these statements 
that D divides M and D divides this combination. So we have D divides M and D divides ML plus one implies D divides their combination. Or two. I'm just going to copy this. 
that because this is actually uh, it's going to be uh, here is uh, school uh, board eight seven five one. So this goes four. So you're going to have seven one four seven one. And I'll kind of leave this for you to fill out, okay? And uh, let me go with the last row in here. This is one. We're going to see that actually this is eight, sorry. This is, uh, this is one. And eight to the third is eight. Uh, this is one, eight, and one. So A to the six for all A's in here, from one to eight is equal to going to one mod six. So we can say this is A to the six is going to one mod, uh, sorry, mod nine for all A that are relatively fine to one. And uh, when I look at that one, or actually, this will be it. This will be it. Uh, I was going to look at another people uh, and uh, try to. So, in other words, it looks like yes, there is. There is this number in the case of six, it is two. In the case of nine, it is six. And there is a relationship between this number and actually the number of values that actually a, this holds for. There are two values and this is it. And these two values, these are the numbers are relatively prime to six. So the two in here looks like are the number of integers or positive integers. Let me say integers between 1 and 6, inclusive, all right, so this is the number between this that are relatively prime, that are relatively prime, prime to 6. So let's, let's see if this is also true in here. So there are six numbers, and each one of these numbers is relatively prime to nine, and the exponent that we have in here is that six. All right, so the f for this example, f of nine, basically, this is equal to six, and the f of six here, for the combination, this is equal to two. Okay, so such a number, such a function, actually uh, does hold. All right. Now we're going to proceed to uh, define this function actually uh, in other world or less. These two examples, these two tables suggest that. Given an M, a positive integer M, and a relatively prime integer, doesn't have to be actually even positive, A, uh, that is relatively prime to M, and then there exists uh, a function, basically F of M, that when you raise A to that, that F of M, you come up with one. Uh, this function is what is called actually Euler's fee function, and we can have to find it now more. Oh, here's the definition. And the, the positive 
The Euler's P function for any 
any I P the uh, numbers less than or equal to P that are relatively prime. to P R 1 to up to P minus 1. And this implies that P of P is equal to P minus 1. Uh, in fact, this is also so it is, if P is a prime, then it is necessarily that P of P is P minus 1. It's also actually it's a sufficient condition. So we have this remark. For any integer, or let's say positive integer, And P of N equals N minus 1 is N only if N is a prime. All right? Already we proved that if P is a prime, then the statement is a true means f of p is or if n is a prime then we have shown above actually the argument just above here we have p of n is equal to n. Now let's have a look at the columns, okay? So uh, in other words uh, we, we get it uh, to the columns. Conversely, assume that T of N equals N minus 1, and we want to show that uh, N is a problem. So, N is what we're going to do it by contradiction. Assume it is not in find something will go wrong. Okay. By contradiction. So you can assume that And is not is is composite. It's not a prime, and this implies that n as a proper factor let's say d such that our factor means D does not equal to 1 and does not equal N. Now, uh, among the integers, if you're counting from them that are relatively prime to N, among the integers, 1, 2, up to N, We have the greatest common divisor of D and N. This is actually it's not equal to 1 since uh, D divides N. And of course, uh, uh, and N divides N. So we have a you know, we have a, 
at least this one is going to be bigger than or equal to D, okay? Since D is, is a minor. We also have the greatest common divisor of N and N does not equal force 1, okay? That's equal N, which means how many integers we can account or take out. So this implies that if we do going to do C of N, this is going to be less than or equal to N minus 2. Okay? But I cannot count the D, I cannot count the N. Okay? So there's going to be actually uh, N minus 2 of this. And this implies that C of N, of course, is not equal to N minus 1, and this is a contradiction. If we are assuming that C of n is equal to n minus one. All right, so this is a final list. So the only prime that actually does uh, hold is uh, means C of n is equal to n minus one are the prime numbers. Now we will look at evaluating uh, the uh, Euler's free function for powers over prime. So this is the first theorem we're going to prove. Uh, theorem 7.1. If E is a prime and K is an integer bigger than or equal to 1, then C of D to the K is equal D to the K minus D K minus 1. Then we can simplify this and write it as by factoring out e to the, key, uh, to the k, 1 minus 1 over c. So the equality between these is very straightforward. Just factor out e to the k here in this procedure. So what we want to show is actually this definition. Okay? So in order to find actually the p of p to the k, we are supposed to find all the numbers that are relatively prime to p to the k, and I'm just count how many. And this particular proof, actually, we're going to look at all the numbers between uh, 1 and p to the k, and throw out, discard the ones which are not relatively prime. Okay? And then we subtract this from the total number, and then we get the formula for p of uh, p to the k. All right? So in here, you're going to consider all the numbers uh, from 1 to up to p to the k and discard the ones that are, are not relatively prime uh, to p to the k. Alright, so the question is, when a number, so here's the question we need to ask, When a number A is not relatively prime to B to the K. Well, we know what are the uh, factors of P to the K are, so if we let's go and list them.
and okay, the only factors of e to the k are one p e square e to the k and so on up to p. So what does this mean? This means that A is not relatively prime. So A for an integer, or A positive integer, is there A is not relatively prime.
this set in here, this, is going to be dk minus 1. So therefore, we have d of d to the k is equal to d to the k minus dk minus 1. All right. We move on to uh, the next objective, and that is to show that uh, Euler's fee function is multiplicative. To do that, we need a first a lemma that will be needed inside the proof. So this is our next objective. Uh, to show P is multiplicative. So we need first a lemma. A, B, C, B integers, even they don't need to be positive. We need it, of course, for when these are positive. Then, greatest common divisor of A, B, C equal 1, if and only if Greatest common divisor of A, B equal 1, and also this is equal to the greatest common divisor of A and C. Proof? Let's go uh, this way. Let's assume that greatest common divisor of A. DC is equal to 1. And uh, let's uh, take D to be the greatest common divisor of A. And by symmetry, we can bring it the same argument for AC. So I'm just going to do it for this and show that D is equal to and equal to 1. So from here, we know that D divides A and D divides B. Now, D divides B implies that B is equal DK for some integer K. Let me multiply both sides of this by C. So this implies we have BC is equal D times CK. And this implies that D divides BC. So we have now A, sorry, D divides A, and D divides BC means D is a common divisor, all right? And this means that actually B is going to be dividing the greatest common divisor of A, BC, which is equal to 1, and this implies that D must be equal to 1. All right? Uh, similarly, we do the other one. Now, let me go the other way around in the proof. Uh, and assume that we have the two latest common dividers equal to 1. So we're going to go this way. We're going to assume that greatest common divisor AB equal 1 equal AC. We're going to use the uh, as uh, identity, which says that uh, AB equal 1 implies that I can express 1. And a combination of A and B means there exists an X1 and a Y1 equal 1. And similarly for the AC, 
equal one implies that a x2 plus c y2 is equal to one. Then we're going to multiply these together and obtain a combination of a and basically uh, uh, bc. All right, so we have here a x1 plus b y1 multiplied by a x2 plus b uh, c y2 is going to be 1 by 1. Now, when you FOIL this out, and you're going to rearrange it so that you would have an A, and every other pair that it's going to be containing there. So you're going to have A x1, x2 plus C x1, y2 plus B y1, x2. And then you want the BC. And there's only one term as that one is y1, y2. One. So by the two terms, since we have a linear combination, or a combination of the A and the BC is equal to one, this implies that A uh, BC equal to one. All right. The uh, next we need to uh, start doing the uh, Proof of phi is uh, multiplicative. We state the theorem. And go over the strategy of proving this theorem. Okay, so this is theorem 7.2. Euler's uh, phi function is multiplicative. So we're going to start with that uh, M and N be two relatively prime positive integers and of course our objective is to show that v of m n is equal v of m times c of n now, uh, if m is equal to 1, then c of m n is going to be c of 1 times n, and this is the same as c of n. Also, we know that phi of 1 is equal to 1, because this is equal to 1. So this one, is, in other words, is giving me phi of n times phi of n. Similarly, if if n equal to 1, then uh, phi of and m is going to be p of 1 times p of m. In the theorem, is, it, it, it actually does hold. So in other words, without loss of generality, we can assume that without loss of generality, we may assume that both m and n are strictly bigger than. So now I'm going to begin actually assume this. Now we're going to take, uh, we're supposed to take, you know, among the integers from 1 to up to n, n the one which are relatively prime to n, n. And that number will be the value of phi function. 
So now I want to go ahead and uh, arrange those numbers in a form of a matrix or a table, rows and columns. Okay. So we're going to arrange the integers one, two, m in here, and so on, up to m, n. All right. In a table, of this form. So we have one, two, three, uh, arbitrary element R in here, and then M. So the first M numbers we're going to have in here, and this one is going to be followed by this, actually it's supposed to be M plus one in here, so m plus 1 comes here, m plus 2, m plus 3, and m plus r, and this one is 2m, m plus m, okay? So this is m plus m. Then we're going to go to uh, 2m plus 1, 2m plus 2. 2m plus 3, 2m plus r, and 2m plus m, which is going to be 3m. And so, so the last thing in here is going to be actually n minus 1, m plus 1, you know, actually, actually this is what it's going to look like. And then this is n minus 1, m plus 1, n minus 1, m, uh, this is plus 2, sorry, this is plus 3. And this one is n minus 1 multiplied by m plus r. And this one is supposed to be n minus 1, m plus m. And when you work this one out, you get, of course, m and n. Or in n. Okay? And so So this is what we're going to do with this table. We're going to look at The numbers that are actually relatively prime to M in here, all right? And show that if one of them, let's say R, is relatively prime to M, if this is equal to 1, okay, if, then all the numbers in that R are relatively prime to M. And they can enter into our count. All right? So with this, so let's say we selected, and I'll look at an example actually to illustrate this. Let's say we selected these columns. All right? One, maybe, and another one somewhere. Okay, then we're going to see that the two means is going to be the little prime to M, the one we see left. Okay, and every element in that column is going to be a little prime to M. And we're going to prove that, of course. And then all others which are not selected, they are not going to be a little prime to M. So it means we are not going to count it. So with this, we're going to have actually a few of these. Columns, they're going to be candidates for being counted as a different prime to M, means each one of them. Now, among these, we need to select those numbers that are relatively prime to N, because we need both M and N. 
All right, and then this is going to give us the right count. Now, uh, just in general, remember that how many of these integers are relatively prime to m? The number of those is going to be phi of m. Because these are such a natural ordering from 1 to m, and the number that are relatively prime to m among these is going to be phi of m, which was, of course, going to depend on m. And this is how we're going to be selecting our part. So there's going to be phi of m. And then we're going to go horizontally now, and we're going to be selecting among these phi of m. And then the total number is going to be the product of phi of m and phi of m. All right, to kind of see the argument, how it's going to work for, uh, I want to look at an example, and then we're going to proceed to uh, do the double. Unfortunately, I may need to write this table, or at least part of it, again. All right, here is the uh, example. Let's take actually uh, uh, m is equal to 6. So this is just an example. So I'm going to take m equals 6 and equal 5. So we're going to arrange, make this table 3, 4, 5, and 6. Okay, so this is the m. And then this is 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, one more, 25, 6, 7, 8, 29, and all right, so the number among these that are relatively prime to 6, okay, are 1 and 5. Okay, so from here, there are P of 6 numbers relatively prime to 6, which is 1 and 5. All right? Now, I believe that all the numbers in this column are relatively prime to 6, which you can see 7 has nothing to do with 6, no prime factor, 13, 19, 25. And if you take the 5, is the same, all these are relatively prime to 6, but all other columns, they are actually not relatively prime to 6. There's 2, 8, 14, all of them have a common factor with 6. So all of these we're going to delete. Because remember, we're going to count only the integers that are relatively prime to the product. And in order to for that, they need to be relatively prime to both M and N. All right? M is the product. All right. Now, let's remove these. And now we have these two columns left. And each column has, of course, five numbers in it. Now, I claim that each one of these numbers is congruent to, all right, each one of these numbers, I want to have to say it in words in it. Each one of these numbers is congruent to either zero, 1, 2, 3, 4, only, exactly to one of these. 
Now remember that 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, this is a complete residue system mod 5. And any one of these is going to be congruent to exactly one of these. Also, the same is true for the numbers in this column. Now, for 1, so of course, this is congruent to 1 mod 5, which we can see in here. This is congruent to 2 mod 5. And this one is congruent to 3 mod 5. 19 is congruent to 8 out 15, 4. And 25 is congruent to 0 mod 5. So none of them congruent to each other, they are all congruent to this. So in other words, this for what we call a complete residue system, okay, for mod 5. It's different than the least, uh, you know, non-negative residue system, which is there. Similarly for these, this is 0, mod 5, and this one is 1, and I'll let you finish the, the rest of it. All right. Now, among these numbers, 1, 2, 3, because these are congruent. If two numbers are congruent, then the greatest common divisor of a number with, with, with 5, in this case, is equal to Actually, if they are relatively prime, then congruent numbers are relatively prime. So among the numbers from 1, from 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 5, the one which are actually congruent, all right, is going to be those 4. Okay, so 4 in here, these are congruent on 5, and the corresponding ones in here is going to be congruent on 5. So we're going to delete this. And from there, we're going to delete that. Now, the total number there is going to be the numbers from 1 to 30 that are relatively prime to 5 and 6, or 30 in this case, are 1, 7, 13, 19, uh, 11, 17, 23, and 20. How many are there? Well, there are two columns in here, and each one of them we pick actually uh, four, so there is an A. So, phi of 30, which is equal to phi of special, it's multiplied. Okay, five times, let me put six there, six times five. All right, and we say this is A. Sorry, this is A, that's what we counted, and V of 6 was 2, and of course V of 5 was 4, okay, it's a prime, and it does give you the correct count, all right? Now, let's see how we would implement this to the general proof, but this is the idea, okay? So, the first thing I want to show is if an R from the top row or the heading of the columns, and we're going to think about the in terms of columns, is relatively prime to M, then the whole column is relatively prime to M. Okay? So this is the first thing. Remember that we have the field of M, we get back to tracking here, P of M N is equal to the number of integers in this set. K such that uh, one less than or equal K less than or equal M N and the greatest common divisor of K M N is equal to one. So we're just going to count the numbers of this set. Now by the lemma. We have the greatest common divisor of K and N is equal to 1 if and only if the greatest common divisor of K 
and m is equal to 1, and this is the same as the greatest common divisor of k and m. Now let's consider a, we're going to be using this, this idea, all right? So uh, let's assume that we have uh, the R column. Let us consider the R Each number in this column, all right, each number in this column has this form, has the form KM plus R, where the K would start in from the top R0, then we have 1, we have 2, up to N minus 1. Please look up the table, this is the way the, let me call this is A actually. So this is the form of the, uh, you know, the entries of the R column. Uh, Right now, uh, let's consider the greatest common divisor of of this a, which is k m plus r. This is an n m. Sorry. So a combination of m with an integer r, and this is equal to, or this is similar to actually the, uh, what we call the uh, division algorithm, so this is the same as the greatest common divisor of R and M. So this means that if the greatest common divisor of R and M is equal to 1, then this is true for all the uh, elements in that column. We write this important implication. So uh, this implies here greatest common divisor of R M equal one. This implies greatest common divisor of any many write it in what any number in the column of R column. And M also this is equal to one. That's exactly what this one is said. All right, and that's exactly what we've seen in the example. Now, how many columns? How many numbers in the column? Or how many? Let me see how I'm going to say this one. Nicely. Uh, yeah, let me say that now there are so among the columns one, two, uh, up to M, there are T of M, and let me say actually among the numbers, okay, among the numbers. And these are the numbers of the thought, okay, one to N, there are T of M numbers that are relatively prime by the definition of 
the G functions are relatively prime. To n. So this means there are P of M comma that contains numbers. Relatively prime to M, and the other columns and the numbers in the other columns and the numbers in the other columns are not. Numbers in the other columns are not relatively prime to n. And hence not relatively prime. To and need to be discarded. Okay, so we don't need this anymore. Now we need to concentrate on this. All right, now here is the next claim is each one of these columns that are that contains numbers that are relatively run to M. Okay, each one of them contains phi of n, number that are relatively prime to n. So this is more or less the last step. So we have the next claim. We put this claim. Each of those columns. Remember, those columns are the one we have relatively prime to M. Okay? As exactly P of N entries. Elements relatively prime to M. To M. So let's say I actually consider one of these columns. Okay, so uh, consider an R column. Where greatest common divisor of R is by R and M is equal to. Now, what are the entries in this part? Okay, the numbers in this column are R. M plus R, uh, 2M plus R, and so on, up to actually N minus 1, M plus. So this is the way. And in fact, this is an arithmetic progression, okay, with first term R and the difference, uh, you know, the common difference is M. So you multiply it by multiples of M. I claim that there is no 
two integers in this list are congruent. Okay. Uh, so here's another claim. And say no two entries. In the above list.
exactly one, one of these integers. Integers zero, one, up to n minus. One other thing is the following. But uh, if S is congruent to T mod N, then greatest common divisor of S N T equal one, if and only if. The greatest common divisor of T and N is equal to 1. That is a crucial point. Now remember that these numbers in the problem, they are congruent to each one of them is congruent to one of these. Alright? So if I think of the numbers in the column are the S ones. And these are going to be the T. So what this statement is saying that if the uh, t and n, okay, it's the one with, from zero to n minus one, are relatively prime to n, then the corresponding numbers from the column that are relatively prime to n are also the same. Okay, for every one, you know, it will be also relatively prime, since there are. T of n numbers among 0, 1, up to n minus 1 that are relatively prime. So we have P of 
T is multiplied. This is a little bit of a proof, but actually, if you just understand the, the idea behind it, it's not hard to, uh, to write. And even if you can shorten the, you know, the writing, then I like it myself. But right. uh, next theorem is we're going to apply these two theorems, which is evaluating, uh, but we know how to find the value of phi for any part of prime. Together with phi being multiplicative, this gives us a formula for a phi of n. Okay, so this is theorem 7. Formula for phi of n in terms of a prime that's contained in n. Delta n equals P1, K1, P2, K2 of PR, KR. P, the prime factorization. Sub 
Yeah, we did this in the year uh, seven two. Okay, so seven uh, or seven one, but seven one is giving us this. All right, and now this product I can write as two products. Uh, I equal one to R. D sub I R sub I. Uh, sorry, I uh, K sub I. And then the product i equal one to r of one minus one over p r. But the third product, this is n, so this is n, and then the product with one minus p i uh, of one over p i. Let me write this one in here actually. So this one in here is n. And then the other product, one minus one over d. Very nice formula for this. Now let's look at uh, some uh, some examples. Evaluate phi of 100. This is phi of 2 squared times 5 squared. And in phi of this is the number itself, 100, multiplied by 1 minus 1 half, 1 minus 1 fifth. I don't need the exponent in it, because I need the prime that are contained in 100. And if you do this calculation, you end up with the value of this is 4. All right? So if you look at that P of 720, all that you need to know is the primes in here. There is 2, and there is a 3 and 5. All right? So this one is going to be 720 times 1 minus 1 half. 1 minus 1 third, 1 minus 1 fifth. And multiply all these together and come up with 1 minus 2. There's one thing you will notice that in here, the, the, the value of phi is actually always an even number, almost. Except phi of 2. Okay? Phi of 2 is equal because this is a prime, it's equal to 1, or the number relatively prime to 2 is 1. So this is the only number that gives us t to be an odd number. So we have a, actually a, a theorem which says that always t is even, except 2. Okay? And of course, one uh, as another thing. Here, seven four for every n bigger than two, p of n is even. And uh, the proof goes like this: first, we can assume. that n is a power of some entity, okay, power of 2, some k bigger than actually or equal to 2. Right, so I want to be bigger than 2, so I need to go bigger than or equal to 2. Uh, then this implies that phi of n is equal to p 2 to the k. And by what we have in here, this is 2 to the k, 1 minus 1 half. All right? And this is equal to 2 to the k minus 1. Uh, now, since k is bigger than or equal to 2, this implies that k minus 1 is bigger than or equal to 1, and this implies p to the n 
which is due to the k minus 1, so this is bigger than or equal to 1 is e. But if it is 0, then it's not, right? So it must be bigger than or equal to 1, so it is e. Now, let's assume that uh, n actually is not of this form. So the next, so assume that n is not a power of two. This implies it, that n must have an odd prime factor. Let's say, then uh, we can write n as b to the k times m, where k is bigger than or equal to 1, and we can assume that uh, p to the k and m, this is equal to 1. In other words, I took out all the primes in n, right back to them out and left every other prime in m. So these are, this is what does this mean. All right, then in here, p of n becomes p of p to the k times m. But since uh, these are an enabling prime and p is multiplicative, then we can write this is as p of p to the k times p of m, but p of p to the k, this is equal, this time I'm going to write it as p to the k minus p to the k minus 1 times p of m. Now, I'm going to factor out a p to the k minus 1 here. This becomes P, all right, and minus 1 times P over that. Now, since P is odd, so from here, P is odd, this implies that P minus 1 is even, and this whole thing, so this is an even integer here, this is even. And this makes this one is P. All right. So this proves that P of N is, in fact, is even. Now, as a bonus, actually, to this, uh, to this proof that P of N is always uh, even, as far as N is bigger than 2, uh, that we can show there are infinitely many primes. In a simple way. So here's the last thing, we might want to put it as a corollary to all of this. There are infinitely many primes. Again, the proof is by contradiction, as usual, and most of these proofs uh, are infinitely many primes. Assume that there are only a finite number of the primes. Let's say P1, P2, up to P sub R. And we're going to let N 
equal B1, B2 up to T sub 1. Now let's take a, a number A with A B an integer. Uh, so it's there one less than A, less than or equal to Now I claim that uh, the greatest common divisor of A and n does not equal to 1 for, for every and to do this we know that uh, by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic okay a must have a prime factorization by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Remember, this does not depend on the number of primes, how many primes are there, okay? A must have, it's either a prime or, okay, or a has a prime factor. So it's in general I could say this must have a prime factor. Let's say a q. But because the only primes you are assumed are p1 to p r, this implies that q is going to be one of them or some. All right, uh, between one and five. Well, this means that uh, when we're going to take the greatest common divisor of this A, which is going to have the BI in it, and N, all right, this is going to be actually not equal to one. So this is going to be uh, at least bigger than or equal to B sub R or Q. All right? And, uh, and this is not equal to 1. So it means that uh, then how, so all these integers, this implies that if you, the P of A, so this implies that P, oh, sorry, of N, this is going to equal to 1. All right? And this is a contradiction. Because it must, this must be, must be E. All right, so this is the, the, the. All right, let's stop right here.